Okay, I think we could go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and welcome to the Office of Economic Development Business Information Session. My name is Margaret McGee. I'm the Business Services Manager. Business services assist entrepreneurs and business owners in starting and growing their business. We help in navigating through the different departments within city government to obtain permits and licenses. We also connect the business community with organizations that can, that can provide technical assistance, incentives, resources, and other programs beneficial in operating a business. One way we do this is we host business information sessions. These sessions are held throughout the year and the topics are gathered from entrepreneurs, surveys, and information we collect from the business community. This is a series of three sessions focusing on protecting your business names and trademarks. Today we have Mr. Glenn Maneri. Did I say that right, Glenn? It's Gene, like Eugene. Gene. Yeah. Gene. Um, and we also have Mr. Mark Molesky. Um, he's a licensed and he's a, a patent attorney specializing in patents, copyright, trademarks, and business formation. Um, Mr. Gene is a co-founder of the Ella Project. Uh, and they are nonprofit here in the city of New Orleans. And he'll get, um, he'll tell you a little more about his organization in a moment. They both will share their expertise on patents and trademarks. To keep down distractions, attendees, please turn your videos off and mute your speakers. I ask that you place questions in the chat box and we'll get to them in a Q&A section. Or if um, Gene and Mark want to do it throughout the presentation, all handouts um, that share with me, I will share with all attendees um, once the presentation is over. Please allow twenty-four to forty-eight hours to get that information. Now I'll go ahead and turn it over to Gene and Mark. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, we're glad to be here. Good to see everybody on the Zoom. As Margaret said, my name is Gene Maneri, uh, co-founder of the Ella Project. We're a, a pro bono legal services provider here in New Orleans, uh, focusing a lot on arts and culture. Uh, we do a lot of work with artists, musicians, and grassroots nonprofits and items of copyright, trademark, contract review, et cetera. Uh, we do a series of um, workshops throughout the year. Some of them are like this that we do on Zoom. Some of them are in person at our home at the New Orleans Jazz Museum down at the end of Esplanade and Decatur at the edge of the French Quarter. Um, today, uh, Margaret and the city have been kind enough to ask us to talk about patent and trademark and name reservation. And while I run a legal program, I'm not a lawyer. So I brought in my good friend and chair of our Louisiana Events Program. Program Mark Malasky. So Louisiana Invents is our uh, patent pro bono program. And it's not just devoted to artists. It's any inventor who meets low to moderate income guidelines and has a new invention that they want to put out there. Uh, we try and match you with a pro bono attorney to take you through. We'll get more into the details of how that program works as we go through the presentation. Um, but since, as I said, I'm not an expert in this subject matter, I brought one in. So we're thrilled to have Mark Malaski, chair of our program, patent attorney and trademark attorney with Intellectual Property Consulting, a law firm in downtown New Orleans, and also a professor adjunct professor over at Tulane University. Um, Mark's going to lead us through the majority of this presentation. And so I think, Mark, if you are you co-host yet, or does Margaret need to make you that so you can share screen? I need to be co-host. All right. So as soon as Mark can be set up as co-host, we can go ahead and run everybody through the presentation. And yeah, as Margaret said, the, the best thing to do is to go ahead and use the chat function 
Um, if you have questions, it's very possible that they're going to be coming up in the next slide, but we'll make sure that we um, get everyone's questions answered. Um, I know that we may still be transitioning, but I'll let Mark tell you a little bit about himself and talk about how we're going to take us through the presentation. Mark, thanks for joining us. Mark, yes, thanks, Jean. Go Mark, ahead, go ahead, Margaret. If you don't have the ability to share, you should be able to share your screen. Oh, I hadn't tried. Um, I was so desperate for the the power of being a co-host. Um, <laughs> oh, here we go. Yeah. I, can everybody yeah. see that? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can see it well. Awesome. Well, thank you, Margaret. And then thank you, Jean, as well. Um, I'm very excited to be um, presenting as part of the city program. It's first for me, so really amped up to be here. Um, and sorry for turning my camera off and on so many times when we got started. I was trying to get my emotional support sign behind me uh, situated so everybody can see our logo. We're very proud of it. Um, so as um, Margaret and Jean both mentioned, my name is Mark Malaski, and I am a registered patent attorney with um, Intellectual Property Consulting. We are a boutique intellectual property law firm here in downtown New Orleans. We do patents, copyrights, and trademarks. We will get them, and then we will go sue people or we'll defend people if we've been sued. And we'll also work on business uh, formation documents and agreements. Generally, that all surrounds um, anybody who has intellectual property assets. Um, but we'll do a little bit more with the business structuring and corporate formations as well. So as you can see by our slides, uh, we're going to talk about patents and trademarks. And we have also put our pictures there in case you forget what we look at, look like throughout the course of the, um, the uh, program. You can absolutely uh, ask me to go back to this first slide. Um, okay. So as much as we want to do... Um, a nice smooth flow. We're going to start it off with a little bit of a, a a quiz here. And even though Gene has seen this slide probably 30 times at this point, he still gets a couple of them wrong. Um, that's not true. He, he aces it. So a couple of questions for you guys. Which of these are wrong? Someone stole my idea. I want to copyright my company's name. I want to get a patent on my invention so nobody knows how to make it. I'm dropping this sick new single. I need to trademark it. It's okay if I use less than 10 seconds of a song. Well, I just got fired. I found myself saying that many times. Um, so I'm gonna go start a competing business using what we've been working on. Any of those sound wrong or are they all right? And um, I'm just yanking your chain. All wrong, oh, that can't be right. Uh, that, that may be no fun, Tina. But maybe they are all wrong. Anybody else have any ideas? Or, as I like to say, why might one of them be wrong? And I will keep us here for quite some time. Yes, I'll do appear to be wrong. It's okay if I use. So let's start there. It's okay if I use less than 10 seconds of a song. That's a little bit of a trick question. So. There's two copyrights, and we're not talking about much about copyright today, but there's two copyrights that are associated with music. One is the sound recording, the actual music you can hear, and then the underlying musical composition, which is the words and the notes. You can't use anyone's sound recording without permission. That's called sampling, and you have to have somebody's permission to do it. But you can actually cover a song where that's performing sheet music and re-record it without permission. You just have to give them notice and pay some money. So cover songs like Jimi Hendrix's All Along the Watchtower of Bob Dylan and Dolly Parton's cover of uh, I Will Always Love You. I'm sorry, Whitney Houston's cover of Dolly Parton. Those are all okay and didn't require permission. So that's a little bit of a trick because that's the whole song. Any other ideas? Or I will just tell you. But I'll give you one more second to guess. All right, I won't, I'm not gonna keep us here online, I promise. So someone stole my idea. Ideas themselves are not actually protectable. It's a particular expression of an idea. So I can't just have an idea of a flower or a long brown haired woman looking funny, um, but my particular expression of an idea, maybe the Mona Lisa is protectable. Um, you can't have an idea of an airplane but the Wright brothers' first airplane, that particular one, that expression of that idea would have been patentable. 
you don't copyright your company's name, that would be under trademark law. I want to patent my invention so nobody knows how to make it. Well, it's actually the exact opposite. You have to tell them exactly how to make it in order to get a patent. That's the deal we have with the government. In order to get a patent for your invention, you have to fully disclose how to make it work. In order to do that, the government will let you say, all right, you can have it for a little while and you can make some money on it. And then the public gets to own it. So for a while, the people who owned um, or made the, uh, the invention of Advil or let's go with like Lipitor, they got to patent their invention, their pharmaceutical and make a bunch of money off of it. And we had to pay a bunch of money for it. And then all of a sudden, once that a patent expires, we get those generic drugs that sit next to it, or we suddenly start getting a name we can't pronounce behind the counter at the pharmacy, and that's because the patents have expired. Um, so dropping a sick new single, I need to trademark it. Um, trademarks are for words or names, short, for short phrases, or logos that identify businesses or sources or origins of products. Copyright law protects artsy stuff whether it's music or a painting or a video or a sculpture. So that's not trademark law, that's copyright law. We already talked about this one here with songs. And that last one is, I just got fired, I'm gonna go start a competing business. Sometimes you can do that. But a lot of times when you are working on something for a company, the company actually owns that. It could be a work for hire, it could be through your um, employment agreement. So it's not always okay if you go take what you're working on. And that can be specific to um, what happens between you and your employer. So not always a good thing to do. I don't see any questions in the chat box. And then I'll rely on Margaret and Jean to keep me from running my mouth too much on any one slide. So keep, keep them coming if we need it. So what is intellectual property? Always a good place to start to define things. That refers to creations of the mind. So creative works or ideas embodied in a form that can be shared or can enable others to recreate, emulate, or manufacture them. There are four ways to protect intellectual property, patents, trademarks, copyrights, or trade secrets. So trade secrets are mostly just kept by going, shh, they're by contract. You tell people not to talk about them, they agree to them in a contract not to talk about them, and you don't talk about them. If you want somebody to protect your trade secrets, you have a contract between you and them. And if they breach that contract and tell your trade secrets, you file a lawsuit against them. That's how you protect trade secrets. So we're not going to talk about those today any further. And going back to that first sentence, creative works or ideas embodied in a form can't just protect an idea and it can't be in your head. The way it's protectable is somebody somewhere has to have written it down in order for somebody else to recreate it later. And that's because, um, copyrights and patents are supposed to expire at some point and the public is then supposed to have access to the, use them eventually. Um, trademarks are a touch different, but it still can't be in your head. So what is a patent? A patent is a limited duration property right relating to an invention granted by the US Patent and Trademark Office in exchange for public disclosure of the invention. So you gotta tell them. What is the right conferred? That is the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering for sale, or otherwise or, or importing the invention to the United States. So that's a pretty cool list. You can stop others from making your invention, using your invention, offering to sell your invention, so that maybe even if somebody else made it, or specifically selling the invention or importing it. So even if you have a US patent, if somebody made your invention overseas, you can stop it at the port. So that's the right to exclude, but as that next bullet said, it's not the right to make it, it's only the right to exclude others. So how long does it last? And it's 20 years from when you first filed your patent application. Pretty fun stuff. So we're gonna talk about what an invention means and how you disclose it and what a patent looks like. So this is not the one slide about patents. So if you thought you were getting shortchanged today, it's gonna be the opposite. I'm probably gonna tell you way more than you wanted to learn. So who's the US Patent and Trademark Office? Uh, our friendly friends up in Washington, DC. Uh, they're very good to the Ella Project. We work with them a lot with Louisiana Invents. Um, Gene's gonna tell you a little bit about that on slide number 15. I know you guys are counting. Um, so, they go by the USPTO for short, 
and they actually have pretty good social media if you want to follow those guys. Um, so applications for patents and trademarks, federal trademarks, not state trademarks, are prosecuted before the USPTO. So they employ examiners that are assigned to each patent and trademark application, and they apply the laws and regulations to applications and allow or reject patent or trademark applications. And that is what I do with most of my day is write those patents and trademark applications um, and deal with examiners trying to get them pushed through. So what does a patent look like? We're about to go look at one, but we're gonna build up to it so we can kind of think about what we're looking at. So the anatomy of a patent. Gonna have something called a specification. And this is just really all of the words explaining what the invention is, because as we talked about in our first couple of slides, we have to have uh, a fully disclosed explanation that we give to the patent office, because that's ultimately gonna go to the public. Because when that patent for Advil expired, some other pharmaceutical manufacturer, if they make generics, needs to be able to pick it up and say, all right, you guys figured out how to make Advil. Well, it looks like we're going to call it ibuprofen now, because Advil is probably somebody's name that they came up with in some big conference room. But how do I make it? And then they read it. And if they know what they're doing in that industry, they say, oh, I start taking my secret blend of urban spices like Emerald, throwing something on some pork. And then the next thing I know, I can put it into a pill and sell it for a couple bucks less. Um, so that's what your written, written description is going to be. Claims are a little funky. They are the legal definition of the invention. We're going to look at those two. And we're going to also look at drawings. Drawings, there's nothing funky there. They're just drawings, and they're going to be funny. All right, types of patents. So there's three different types of patents. The vast majority of them are called utility patents. And that just means they're for something useful. Those can be products. Those can be processes. Or those can be improvements on products or processes in the last 20 years from the filing date. So you can have a plant patent, so that just literally means some type of plant that is asexually reproduced, or a design patent. Um, and that's for the way something looks. Now that I think about it, I actually have one in my office that I can grab. Here we go. Um, so we filed a patent application for this tequila bottle, which was granted and is now subject of a patent. I should have probably grabbed this. And it's for the shape. So cool little bottle, kind of looks like a horseshoe. Um, and if we were trying to patent the way this worked, we'd be trying to talk about how it encloses the fluid. It's got a top that allows some of the fluid to come out. And that's where your, your application would be stressing. But when you try, when you have a design patent application for the shape, it's the actual physical shape of something that is useful. And that prevents you from having um, copycats because then you can go sue them for patent infringement because you still have the right to exclude others. And then went on the market as this, where am I going? Here we go. Here's the camera. It's a Kilo brand. It's good stuff. But so you can tell it's empty. That's why it was good stuff. Um, Pancho y Cisco. Um, so those are the difference. That's the way they look. We're gonna look in a utility patent here in a second. So there's types of patents, and then there's types of patent applications. So people will often file one of these then the other, but you don't have to do that. You can skip the first of the two. So the first of the two is a provisional patent application. So this can be informal, um, in industry we call it quick and dirty. Um, it's kind of like a rough draft. And there's lots of reasons to file a patent application quickly. Um, so sometimes if you want to get to the patent office early uh, and you want to do it, uh, we're going to talk about those reasons in just a couple slides. But if you want to get to the patent office quickly, um, a provisional application is a great way to do that because the patent office will not look at it, um, but it gives you patent pending status for a year. And... Um, if you fully disclose the invention, it gets you what's called your filing date or your priority date and time freezes. So getting a patent is all about who invented something first. So if you're on February 20th, you invent a new type of liquor bottle, time freezes and the only liquor bottles that might be relevant to whether or not you can have a patent are from 
February 20th backwards. If somebody invented a new liquor bottle tomorrow that was just like yours, it wouldn't matter because you already got there. So provisional patent application can be a quick way to get in there um, fast. Uh, it's cheaper, um, but then it's going to die on the vine. After one year, um, you're not going to have patent application pending anymore. So you will have to file a non-provisional application if you want to keep it going. Um, and, a non, and a provisional application cannot be renewed. So you have a one-year patent application uh, pending status, and then you go into non-provisional. So this is subject to formal requirements. So it has to look a certain way. And the next slide is going to show you what it looks like. Um, it does get examined by a patent examiner. A provisional one will not. And you can claim priority to a provisional application to take advantage of the earlier filing date. So if you wanted to be the first one to the patent office because you wanted to make sure that time stopped so there weren't relevant inventions that might block you, you can piggyback, they call it claiming priority to that earlier date. Um, and there's more fees that are available. So the vast majority of people that apply for patent applications that are individuals or that um, are uh, small businesses qualify for what's called micro entity. And that means their income is less than 200,000 and some change. The filing fee for a provisional is about, I think it's like $68. They just changed it. And for a non-provisional is $364. For a non for, for what's called a small entity, and that's someone who makes over $200,000 in change, or an entity that has more than 500 employees, um, those numbers essentially double. So the non-provisional is 664, and a provisional application is something like 130. So the numbers can get a little bit more expensive, especially if you start doing a lot more of them. But um, it's not terribly unaffordable if you're a micro entity. Um, and that's a pretty cool way to get started. All right, this is what a patent looks like. So I guess this guy wanted to really ramp up his dating life. So he was like, what is it that I could do to really, uh, really get the ladies? So he thought to himself, presumably had a couple of cocktails. And he's like, I'm gonna wear my hamster around. So he took a vest and he took some translucent tubing, didn't stop there, also got some translucent boxes and then must have gone into his backyard and got some leaves just for rounding it out because you don't want to be underdressed when you're out trying to find uh, somebody of the opposite sex. Um, and he came up with what is called pet display clothing. And this is subject of US patent number 5901666. Normally I like to play a game, can anyone guess why it's that number? And that just means that it was the one after 665. Um, the numbers have no meaning other than they're sequential. And it came out on May 11, 1999. However, you would calculate the duration of the patent from August 25th, 1997, which is the filing date. You can see that on the left. Um, I'm going to actually pull up the patent in a second. Um, why do you have to do that differently? Probably because somebody in DC wanted to make it more complicated. Um, maybe they wanted to make sure patent attorneys had jobs. I don't know um, if that was it. Thank you. Um, if they just wanted to be difficult, also possible. I'm just not clear. Uh, anyway, that's, um, that's how that works. So let's take a look at this guy. And please stop me if you have questions. Chat's very quiet and there's no way I'm being that clear. So um, clarity is not my strength. All right, so here is our patent. Hopefully everybody can see that. Somebody will probably tell me if you can't. Um, for pet display clothing. So we talked a little bit a couple of slides ago about the anatomy of a patent. You have the specification, the claims, the drawings, the abstract. So um, yeah, sure I can. I've got a good question for Tina. Um, so if, if 360 or so is the USPTO fee, what would the range of lawyers fees be? Um, and like any good lawyer answer, it varies. Um, and the technology that we'd be working with varies and makes it vary a lot. So something like a pet display vest doesn't have any like significant moving parts. Um, there's no electricity, there's no Bluetooth, 
Um, but this was also in 1997. So maybe now it might, you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Belial here might have decided that in this day and age, version 2.0 needs to have solar panels and hook into his Tesla. Um, and when you start adding more features like that, has to have Apple CarPlay or Apple Gerbil Play or whatever he's going to have here, um, that can make it more expensive. So I would say the range at our firm for a patent application to get started, the bottom end is probably around 1500 bucks for an easy invention. And the top end, we probably wouldn't go over four grand. That's probably the range. So for something like this, I'd probably say um, 1500 to 2500 bucks in attorney's fees for a provisional and then probably 2000 to 30 to 3000 or so for a non-provisional. Um, and then if it got more complicated or if it was computer software, it starts to get towards the upper end. Um, that's the range I would kind of give you as a ballpark. Um, and then there's the, oh, absolutely. You're very welcome, Tina. And then, so that's, those are the fees. And then there's the filing fee, which is the 364, the 664. And then there's one other fee, which is going to be for drawings. Now this had four drawings and that's absolutely sufficient. Um, there's an entire service industry of um, people that are professional draftsmen. And even though this one is funny because it is a guy wearing a gerbil outfit, um, I think patent drawings are super cool and really good looking. And these guys specialize in them and they'll come back and they're just awesome. They typically around 25 to 30 bucks a sheet if you go with one of the sort of budget vendors and they can go as high as about 70 bucks a sheet. So you just multiply that times however many you have. So this one would have been about 120 bucks or something. Um, they can go up to about 400 bucks maybe. So if you're looking at about $700 in fees and then whatever the lawyer's fees are. I know that's always a very um, a very big question is if I want to get a patent application, how much does it cost? That'll get you on file. And then just depending on whether or not you have any back and forth with the uh, patent office, there can be additional fees for arguments and time interacting with the um, with the with the patent office. Sometimes they come back and they're ready to give you a patent. And sometimes they are ready to put their um, foot down and say no. So that can be a range, um, and that's hard to predict just based on uh, what all is out there. But we'll, we'll talk about what that looks like with rejections in just a second. So um, abstract kind of a short little blurb explaining what the invention is. So somebody picks this up and says, oh, look, a Vester belt is integrally formed with a tubular pet receiving passageway. So we looked down here, oh, look, tubular pet receiving passageway, which extend around the wearer's body and terminate in pocket-like chambers for feeding and retrieval. Well, that kind of makes sense. These little tubes or the little pet tubes go all the way around and go into the pet pocket. Easy enough. So, and it goes on a little bit longer. So as we're on this page with all the figures, you can see numbers. So these numbers refer to all the parts. So over here, I'm gonna zoom in real big on figure one. Figure one, number one's got this arrow and that's probably pointing generally at the invention as a whole. And now you see over here in the bottom corner, I'm pretty sure you guys can see my cursor. Somebody will tell me if you can't. Um, number two is pointing right here. That's probably going to the, uh, the um, pocket as a whole. And now 14 has this arrow. That's probably going to the entry hole. So W-H-O-L-E versus H-O-L-E. And then four, you're probably pointing to either an entry or the tube. And then presumably number seven here, he's gone with the leaves. So. When we go and look at the specification, which is the written description, we'll see where he starts explaining how it all works together. I'm gonna to be honest with you, these are not fun to read. So this is the text of a patent. So up front was just the intro page. This is the text of it. So it says, what field of the invention are we in? So the field is wearing clothing. I don't think it's a very big field. It might say the field is um, app software applications for um, hailing a ride share. 
might say uh, hot dog slicing, could say whatever. Then they're saying why we need it because uh, we don't have inventions yet like this. Well, pretty sure that's true. Summary of the invention is um, what patent attorneys use to put the claims up top. And I'll show you what the claims are. The drawings, it just tells you what we're looking at. So front view of a pet display vest, rear view of a vest, two plugs, and then there's the belt. Easy enough. So can't show you to you side by side, but now it says, as shown in figure one and two, the pet display vest or waistcoat one incorporates a pair of front waist level pockets two, forming animal or several animal receiving chambers three which communicate with a system of enclosed animal receiving passageways four, which encircle the waist areas and extend up and across the chest and back areas over the shoulder areas, defining a tortuous labyrinth crawl path for rodent-like pets five. So I'm not gonna read you a couple of pages because I think the number of people in the chat would, or I'm sorry, in the, in the class would start decreasing rapidly. But he starts to walk from the bottom of the invention all around and explain to you how it works. So he just starts down here and starts telling you this. So the reason he's telling you all this, and he's going to go on later and say what it can be made out of. So he says, hey, look, you can have some hook and loop fabric, or he called it hook and eye, which is sold under Velcro. And the whole point is somebody who makes clothing later or somebody who's in the space where they could make clothing can pick this up and make it so because i'm sure y'all are getting sick of me going back and forth quickly but because this patent was in 1997 i have probably got the best news since anyone who caught a coconut or a musha shoe all week um you are free to use this because of mr belisle's hard work and contribution to society um this patent is now in the public domain and any one of you any one of you can make this at home based on um, his contributions. So how long is a normal processing time? <laughs> um, I don't know. Don't do, do it when you're young because you may not live to see it is probably the easiest answer. Um, so so let's, let's pause there. So a patent application, so the non-provisional application will last... Um, well, it will pend. The easy answer is probably about 18 months when they get back to you. It's a year and a half. Um, you can speed that up a couple of ways. Um, first one is the most American way possible, and you can pay more money. Um, they have something called uh, track one request, and that's about 800 and something dollars for the micro entity. It used to be easy numbers to remember, but they've changed. It's like 840. Um if you're a first time inventor that qualifies for micro entity, they have a new program um, that is a first time inventor pilot program. I have used that now twice, but I have, it's been so recent since I filed it. I don't know how quickly that goes, um, but the track one gets you back three to four months. So I'm hoping the first time filer is three to four months. Also, if you're over 65, um, you can use a petition to make special based on age and that they usually get back to you in three or four months. That one's actually really fast. Um, and then if you get a refusal from the patent office, uh, sometimes it'll go back and forth quickly. Sometimes it won't. I just did one where I filed a pretty lengthy response six or eight months ago and I just got the response back. So um, they're not often in a hurry and they're, they're government employees. Uh, in DC. So, and we all answer to them. So they move at their own speed and there's not really any recourse that we can do to get them to push fast. Um, like we treat them as kind of, you know, a court. So there's not, there's not any kind of way that you can like press judges to go faster. It's a similar stick. Um, so once you go through the process and you get a patent, um, you do not have to do anything else with it. It is effective. So you pay, you pay a couple of sets of fees. You'll pay what's called an issue fee. Um, that's almost analogous to like a registration fee. So that's a great question, Margaret. Um, but that's all at the federal level. And then it, this is a federal right at the federal level and you don't have to do anything local. So 
um, no need to go get it blessed at the Secretary of State or with the um, with the clerk of the court here. It is a U.S. patent and it is effective in the U.S. and all of its territories. So excellent question. So the question is then, what is it that is effective in the U.S. and its territories? What are my rights? Um, how would you find that out? The scope of your rights are what's in the claims. So you can see down here at the bottom of column three. Oh, absolutely, Margaret. Um, it says what I claim is, and this is your, your, you're claiming your property rights, basically. So it says, we can zoom this in a little bit. So we're only going to look at one of these. Because a pet display vest for a person, so having an elongate, so he's referring to that clear tube, enclosed pet receiving passageway extending there across, so just this long tube across, with at least one closable pet admitting entry, at least part of the passageway being transparent so that when the vest is worn, a pet moving across the passageway across the wearer's body can be viewed. Um, as funny as this invention is, this is an incredibly good claim. So Mr. Belisle for 20 years had, or well, probably 18 when it got issued, had the right to exclude anybody that had any piece of clear tubing with a pet admitting entry that they wore. Um, the one thing that he did that was a little too um, could have been broader. It could have said a pet, pet display piece of clothing, and that would have been broader. But if you start having more and more things in here, if you said it was blue, it had to have leaves, it had to be uh, curved and twisted, the, that means that more people have to do more things to get to what's in your invention. So because the claims are the legal scope of your invention, and if somebody steps on the rights that you have, that's where patent infringement comes in. So when you think about patent infringement, now we're talking about somebody else violating your rights. So Mr. Belisle here has the right to exclude somebody or anyone else from making, selling, offering for sale, uh, using or importing a pet display vest for a person having an elongate with a passageway and an entry, and it's got to be transparent. Anyone who does that is infringing. They only have to do about three things here to infringe. The longer this list is, the harder it is to infringe. So you want a good, strong claim, which has fewer words because it's a shorter checklist to get up to that point. Um, so that's a patent. If anyone has questions or wants to look at that further, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to jump back to PowerPoint. The only thing more exciting than reading a patent is reading a PowerPoint. So we're going to pivot back over there. All right. So that's what a patent looks like. We've talked about applications, but how do you actually get a patent? So first of all, what can be patented? So whoever invents any invents or discovers any new and useful process, machine, manufacturer, composition matter, or any new or useful improvement thereof may obtain a patent, therefore, subject to the conditions and requirement of this title. And we're reading the law there. So when they say new, that means it's novel and not obvious. Well, what does that exactly mean? Novelty in the patent world means that there's no invention identical to yours out there. And what they're talking about is invention means the claims. So when Mr. Belial said, I have a vest with a tube that has a hole in it, that means there was no one else that had a vest with a tube and a hole in it. But it also can't be obvious. Nobody who typically makes vests would have also thought to put a tube and a hole on it so you can see a critter going through. And that's probably true. Um, although maybe they didn't go to enough Mardi Gras and see what happens around here because you can see a whole lot of things attached to a whole lot of clothes. So entirely possible they didn't do enough research. And then useful is, just means you've got to be able to make it work. Um, that's a bit of a shorthand, but you start thinking about people making um, perpetual motion machines where it just doesn't stop moving. Um, people can walk through walls or time travel. Uh, you used to see a whole lot more of those get published because people file that kind of nonsense all the time. Um, but there's also laws of nature you can't patent. 
natural phenomenon, um, abstract ideas got to be concrete. This can get a little problematic when you are filing um, computer algorithms. They might say, oh, this is just an idea or this is something that can, it's like a mental process and it's not something that's concrete enough. So what is prior art? So when they're trying to figure out if you're novel and not, not, not obvious, they're going to evaluate you against what's already known. So I mentioned earlier, when you want to rush to the patent office and file first, uh, you're trying to limit the amount of prior art that's out there because you're supposed to be first. So everyone else that's before you is who you're competing against to make sure that you invented this first. The prior art is any evidence that your invention is already known. Prior art does not need to exist physically or be commercially available. It is enough that someone somewhere sometime previously has described or shown or made something that contains a use of technology that is very similar to you or your invention. Now, I got that definition from the European Patent Office just because I like the way it was phrased. Same thing, uh, and patents are examined pretty much the same way all over the world. Um, so that definition is totally fine. And this used to be a French colony, so we can use the EPO and that's no big deal. Um, so prior art is the body of knowledge that somebody is going to look at and say, all right, is this new and different from that? Um, okay. So then to get a patent, you have the three hurdles. We talked about these a, a touch second, a touch ago. Um, so novelty is the first hurdle. That means invention must not be found in the prior art, can't be just like it. And that's the base of existing public knowledge. Um, I just want to come back up here. So this can be very frustrating for a lot of people. There are a lot of really, really good ideas that have been written about or applied for for a patent app, and then the application has been published but not granted or have been patented but are never commercialized or never built. Um, the vast majority of patents, we're talking well over 90%, maybe even over 95%, are never commercialized or never made. So a lot of people have really good ideas, but then don't know how to get them made or don't know how to start a business. And that's why this great office is doing good work to help them do those things. Um, and we're excited to, to help. Um, the frustrating thing for inventors nowadays is they might be like, oh, I've been in this industry for 25 years and I've never seen anything like it. I am sure it doesn't exist. Well, you're probably right. And you probably have a really good idea that you, and you came up with something, but somebody else may have already come up with that idea 20 years ago and just never commercialized it because they couldn't or didn't or whatever happened. So um, that product never hit the market. But if it's been patented or published, it can still be considered prior art for patentability purposes because the whole point of a patent is to get information um, into the public. That's a great question, Margaret. So there are resources you can search yourself. Um, we actually, so this, Gene's going to talk about this for a second. We have a couple of links, I believe, on our website, but um, patents.google.com is a great way to start. Um, you can also use regular Google. Um, that's just on your own. And sometimes you can figure it out and get a hit. Um, the patent office's website is not amazing, um, but it's okay. And there's a couple other searches like freepatentsonline.com. You can also get the help of an attorney to order a patentability search. Um, and there are vendors out there that, um, yes, thank you, Gene. There are vendors out there that specialize in this. And those searches can run from four or 500 bucks to um, almost $2,000, depending on whether you get an overseas vendor that um, may be cheaper versus somebody based in the US that has all American patent attorneys or patent agents. It just varies depending on where they are. Um, and they can all do very, very good work. Um, and they'll do a patentability search for you and they can help get you the lay of the land. The other thing is um, the, um, the patent office is gonna do that search too. And some people don't wanna invest in whether or not there is a patent search and just let the patent office figure it out. Uh, a third um, frustration is that that not that uh, obvious thing. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, you can't always predict what the patent office is gonna say. So we, we can only read that crystal ball so much, 
and then we might have to argue anyway. So we talked about that novelty hurdle number one, it can't be found in the prior art, but here's where it's sort of a matter of opinion. So when we talk about an invention versus the prior art, we're not just randomly talking, should, can anybody think about this invention or could have figured it out, but a person that has the ordinary skill in the art, somebody that always does this. So if you've got a new invention for a transmission, then we want to think about a mechanical engineer. If you've got a new invention for a surgical device, maybe a biomedical engineer or a physician or somebody that's specifically a surgeon. If you've got a new pharmaceutical, it needs to be a chemist or somebody that is maybe a pharmacist. So you think about the person in that specific field and then excuse me, when you think about those people in that space, they say the invention must differ from the prior art in the meaningful way, an inventive step. So I like to imagine one of these people and the acronym for a person having the ordinary skill in the art is Fozita, I'm not making that up. So Fozita walks up to this buffet of all the knowledge of all the tools that they would use in any given day. And if they would have grabbed or made a plate of the things that they normally get off that buffet, and it's normal for them to combine the elements of the claim, the pieces of the invention, then it is an obvious invention. But if it's not a usual invention, uh, then you argue it's new. Normally what happens in this situation is you apply for a patent and the patent office is gonna come back and say, hey, look, I, Appreciate that you have found um, an invention that you think you want to get a patent for. So I applied for this water cup here. Got a top, a bottom, and a pop top here. However, the prior art has this coffee cup, which is a top, a bottom, and a screw top. Now, little bit different you created the pop top however i found the liquor bottle and it's got a pop top so i'm going to combine these two drinking containers together the coffee cup and the liquor bottle's pop top and that's going to block your coffee cup or your water cup done sorry i seem to have a lot of drinking vessels on my uh desk which is fortunate that's generally how it happens. Um, and then you have to argue why it's different. You'd have to argue like, hey, look, my new pop top has a rubber seal. It opens and closes. It's not just the same pop top as a, as a, um, a cork on a liquor bottle. Um, so then, and then you, can, you might have to make some distinctions and sometimes that'll work. Um, the Yeti's top is very different than the top of a tequila bottle. And the last thing is you gotta be able to make it work. Pretty easy for mechanical inventions, um, much more difficult. Um, for high level things. Um, you might roll in and say, I have the cure to cancer. And they say, no, you don't prove it. Um, the Wright brothers said that they had figured out heavier than air flight and they had to prove it. Um, and then they got the f f patent for the airplane. Stop me with questions. Otherwise I'm gonna keep going. So there's also another important year. We're pivoting off a little bit. Um, the what's, in, what's patentable into something else, how you can get yourself in a little bit of trouble. Um, the inventor is the one that knows the invention. So the inventor has the ability to set their own filing date, filing deadline by releasing the invention into the wild. So we talked about the prior art and distinguishing the um, invention from the prior art. Um, if somebody else hasn't invented an invention before you, there's nothing you can do. The actions of others who preclude the to preclude patentability, somebody else already has a patent on the invention. Somebody else has already described the invention in a printed publication. If the invention is already in public use, is already on sale, or there's some other way that the invention has been made available to the public before the effective filing date, um, there was nothing the inventor could have done differently. And the invention is not novel. However, the inventor can also cause their own invention not to be novel by disclosing it to the public. The patent statutes give you a one-year grace period uh, to make sales, 
make disclosures, make public use of your invention before you file. So you set your own filing date. It's like you walk out the front door and just yell, hey, everybody, here's my invention. And then a clock starts ticking. Um, so the action of the inventor that can preclude patentability is like more than one year, more than one year and more than one year. Once you hit a year after telling everybody about it or selling it, then your rights lapse. And when I mean your rights lapse, like it's over. You do not have the ability to get a patent. Now, it's possible the patent office doesn't figure that out, um, but they might. But then if you go try to sue somebody, the first thing they're going to do is try to figure out when your thing was on sale. Um, are we going to 1.30 or 3 o'clock or 2 two thirty? Margaret? We're going to three, right? I'm sorry about that. I had the participant in chats covering my my <laughs> mute over there and I couldn't get to it. No um, worries. We're scheduled to three o'clock. Um it just good. depends. Yeah. Um Trade, trademarks I, I just saw I just see that now it's time to get your question answered. Yeah, trademarks don't take as long as patents. Um no, no, no. I was just saying that to the audience because good, yeah, definitely get, ask. Yeah, I get all these questions and now everybody's mm -hmm. shy, but mm -hmm. they have the professional here. So now is the time to get those questions answered. Yeah, the professional is here and I'm here too. But so that you know, we got Gene <laughs> and then I'm also here. <laughs> yeah, so I want to make sure we're not pressed for time so we can um oh, get no, all no, the no. questions. We're, but, we're but, fine. But please um awesome, but yeah, and I'll go over if I need to. I have no problem taking everybody's time, um, but please definitely ask. So this is a big one. And this one, uh, to use a technical term, can really suck if you miss it because we get a lot of people with really good inventions and then they're on sale too long. Um, and that can be really frustrating. And, and, and it's hard too when you want to think about, oh, I want to sell this and see how it does. Or then you finally realize, man, this has been on sale for a little while. I think I should get a patent. And you realize that um, the ship has already sailed. So you know, keep it in mind. Um, this is also, um, I think now that it's a patent, how do you make money? We, we go sell it. Um, so depending if you have an invention, uh, I mean, the short answer is there's two ways to make money, right? Um, you either, so if you have an invention, we're just gonna, um, we're gonna, we're gonna stick with the, um, the, the gerbil sweater. Um, so Jessica, so when you say now that you have the patent, so what you would mean there is you've applied for the patent, you've applied the, you sent in the application, it has been examined by the patent office, and it has ended up looking like this with United States patent and patent number. So that means it's an enforceable patent. So you can wave your patent around and tell other people to stop. You can also have a patented product, which people aren't supposed to copy. That should keep the honest people honest and deter the bad guys in theory. Um, so in this guy's case, he would sell vests and he would mark his vests as patented. And people would say, wow, I've got this fancy new patented vest. I paid $49.99 for it and I can carry around my gerbils. Um, and suddenly nobody's sitting next to me at the restaurant. And I thought this is going to finally make me less lonely. Or you can find a way to get somebody to buy your patent from you. And you can say, all right, um, I don't, I don't, I can't even begin to try to speculate who I could use as a, as an example, clothing company or influencer that you might want to approach with this, but they could say, who wants to buy my patent? And they could just buy it from you because patents are a piece of property. You can sell your house, you can sell a patent, or you can have a license for it. And you can say, all right, I own this patent and I'm going to let some manufacturer make the invention. Um, and I'm going to get some revenue or royalties. So lots of different ways to make money off that. Um, excellent question. Not just something to put on your mantle, although that can be a nice place to put it. Hopefully that answered it. Um, so thinking about triggering that filing deadline, showing the invention without confidentiality restrictions. Um, if you're rolling into a machine shop or a sewing shop or something, you have confidentiality restrictions, so it's not a public disclosure. Well, that's not really going to do it. Um, you can't go to lakeside mall and set up a booth and say all right come into my booth and close a thing like we're going to go vote for president and say this is confidential and everybody comes in there and signs an nda that's not going to work but 
normal confidential kind of setting, that's not going to trigger it. Um, but without confidentiality sessions, settings, you're going to have a problem. So a trade show, demos, TV commercials, those are all going to trigger that filing deadline. It's also a good way to get your invention stolen. So keep in mind that having an NDA is a good idea as well. Um, so also publishing a professional paper. A lot of people that are engineers love to publish papers, um, professors as well. Uh, product sales or offering to sell the product. Now, there's a difference between I'm going to, you, you put something up online and saying take pre orders, that's offering to sell the product, or actually selling the product, that's selling the product, but selling the rights to an invention, um, that is different. That does not count. Um, experimental sales may also be okay if you're working on it and you're selling some. As, a, as like a demo, it's like, hey, you wanna try out this test one and let me know what you think. We're still doing some changes. Um, you can also do experimentation and that's not gonna um, count. But once the invention is ready to be patented and you have no more experimentation, um, it's time to make the, it's time to file the application. And that can be uh, hard to justify. I've seen uh, clients lose that battle when the courts have said you were actually on sale already and now you're just saying it was experimentation because you didn't have proper documentation of any more changes you were making. So the big takeaway point that I think is probably the most important in any of these talks to the public is all public disclosures or sales will trigger the one year grace period except proper experimental use or sales. Um, best practice is to file an application, often a provisional, before any of these events occur. Just get it patent pending. Um, our firm can do it cheap. There's also an extremely attainable option. Um, we don't usually do pat, pat provisionals, but we have before, and I'm going to let the Honorable Mr. Maneri talk about that. Thank you, Mark. Good to see everybody. Thanks for taking us through um, that always entertaining and interesting dive into what's a complicated process that I think you make very um, digestible and things that everyone can figure out. So, and that's key to work with our pro bono program. So a few years ago, the federal government and the America Invents Act wanted to make sure that legal fees were not going to be a hindrance to getting new inventions into the public sphere. And so uh, Congress passed an act that set up funding to provide um, pro bono services in all 50 states. Um, and the Ella Project covers the state of Louisiana. So I said earlier, and I know I see some of our artists and musician clients on here, most of our services are for artists and musicians, but this is the one exception. So this is not something that's artist specific. This is any inventor with any invention within any place in Louisiana, all 64 parishes. Um, now there are income requirements. They're pretty generous. It basically comes out to be about 200% um, of what the federal government declares is low to moderate income, what it ultimately breaks down to is roughly, you know, about an $80,000 or less income for a, for a two income household. So a lot of people do actually qualify for uh, patent pro bono through Louisiana Invents. Um, and Mark has given you the idea of what we're looking at here. There is a little bit of uh, pre-work you need to do. There's an online tutorial the USPTO needs to put out. Uh, because it's a federal program, they do require you to attach your tax return to your application. And we do ask that you've performed a little bit of a prior art search. We don't expect everyone to be an expert on prior art. That's why the program exists. But, you know, the easiest way to find out if somebody else has your ideas to use that Google.patents or free patents online and at least take a look at it. It doesn't mean that you're going to have a definitive answer one way or another, but it's a good way to figure out if somebody else has, has had the same concept. And then, of course, as Mark mentioned, you have to be able to actually do the thing. That's something that we've run into issues before. Someone's got a great idea. We go, all right, well, now it's time to show us that you can build it. But, well, I can't build it. So all of that ahead of time makes the application process so much easier for us. The way that it works is we'll get an application. Oops, there's no fee to apply. 
Um, and then we'll have it reviewed by a volunteer attorney. We have a roster of people that will look over it, do a more thorough prior art search, see what they come up with, and then we'll come back with an opinion to you. We'll say either, yes, this looks like something that we think is patentable, um, and if so, we'll try and match you up with another volunteer. Could be the person that did the search, could be somebody completely different, um, or we'll come back and say, look, in the viewpoint of our committee, um, the chances for patentable success or slip. That doesn't mean that we're 100% correct either, but it does mean at that point that our relationship is going to cease. Um, if we do match you with an attorney, take you through the process of getting that initial application off to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And then as Mark said, sometimes the response period can take 18 months and sometimes life intervenes in that 18 months. So our goal is to get your application successfully in and all of that can be done with no fee. Um, it is a matching service. Matches are not guaranteed. But, you know, we've had a pretty good success rate once we've had applications that have been approved that we've been able to match them with a volunteer who's been able to take them through the process. So I encourage everyone to take a look at it. I'm going to go ahead and put the link to our website. It's just in the services section of our website at elanola.org. I'm going to put it in the chat right here. And you just scroll down a little bit and you'll come to the Louisiana Invent section. It is a separate application than our typical application for legal services. Um, and I encourage you guys to check it out. That's what I got. Awesome. Well, thank you, Gene. Um, all right. So one thing that um, I'm going to point out there uh, so it says, have either attended an Ella project, bar napkin inventions, patent workshop, or completed the USPTO's online tutorial. If anyone's thinking about applying, um, this, this will not, this presentation does not count for, um, bar napkins. Unfortunately, um, we'll probably do a bar napkins at some point, but if you're interested in getting excited, I have taken the USPTO online tutorial, mostly because I figured I needed to know what I was presenting in the bar napkins presentation. Uh, it's a great resource, um, learn a lot. So uh, only takes about an hour um, and bar napkins takes about an hour. So just go ahead and do that and, um, uh, and then go through that and pretty exciting little thing. All right, trademarks. Um, we are moving away from patents. I'm setting you all free. Um, unfortunately, I will not be set free. I will have to do some more of those once I am done with this. That's why I'm taking so long to go through it. Um, trademarks. So a trademark is a word, phrase, symbol, and or combination thereof, which identifies and distinguishes the source of goods. Service mark is the same thing, except that it applies to services. So trademarks, lots of them. They look all kinds of different ways. Um, how can the bottom be true? You got basically the same structure. You got the same name, Delta and Delta. You got the Greek letter Delta, which is a triangle there. Um, all to the left, slightly different uh, tweak on it. That doesn't seem right. Anyone have any ideas? I'm going to resume with our camera off so I won't linger too long. Well, the key is there is no consumer confusion. The whole lay of the land for trademark law is whether consumers will be confused. So consumers will not be confused by the source or origin of the goods or the services. So where these products or services are coming from, the services being airline services, products being faucet and bathroom product services um, by the coexistence of these two companies in the marketplace. You're not going to go to Home Depot to check into your flight and you're not going to go to the airport to buy a toilet. Um, the other thing is I just got a pair of shoes up here and they're red bottoms. Anybody know what those are? I come from humble means. Very, go ahead, Margaret. Very no, very, very expensive shoes. That's what they are. Yeah, that's right. So I, I'm a simple kind of man. Um, but through my job, I learned that those are Christian Louboutins. Um, and as Margaret said, they're very expensive. So the color red, 
something called secondary meaning. If uh, a color or uh, there's a couple other things that can count too, um, but if it acquires enough consumer recognition that that actually I helps you identify or specifically identifies um, a company or a product or a producer that can qualify as a trademark. So some other famous ones are Brown, like UPS trucks, uh, Tiffany blue, Cadbury purple. Um, a lot of people want to say, Oh wait, what about the McDonald's golden arches? Well, the color gold does not help you identify McDonald's, but the golden arches do. So the arches are a logo, and those are a trademark, but the color gold, not for McDonald's. So exciting. So there are five types of trademarks when we're thinking about words. These are categories. One is a generic trademark, and that is one that refers to or has become understood as referring to the genus of what the particular product is a species. Um, I have an engineering background, so words aren't really like easy for me. So genus means sort of the overarching uh, type of thing. And then a species is a specific one of those. So I might say a genus is a hot sauce. So a hot sauce has a bunch of different types of things and the species might be tabasco crystal louisiana sriracha that'd be a species so a generic term would be hot sauce so louisiana hot sauce crystal hot sauce but then um crystal for example would not be generic that might be something else descriptive so that identifies a significant characteristic of the article so that conveys an immediate idea of the qualities or characteristics of the goods. So to become protected, that requires secondary meaning. We're going to look at a bunch of examples of these. Um, so by itself, if you have either a generic mark or a descriptive mark, those cannot be protected. But a descriptive mark has the ability to become protected if it gets secondary meaning. Now, the next three are called inherently distinctive. They're always protectable. So that's a suggestive trademark, which requires imagination, thought, and perception to reach a conclusion as to the nature of the goods. Arbitrary is a use of a common word in an unfamiliar way. And fanciful is a word invented solely for the use of trade as a trademark. So there's five categories that we're talking about. The first two are unregisterable, descriptive, if it has secondary meaning, and that is another way to think about it, a popularity contest in the wild with the people, consumers. And these three are inherently distinctive. Now, what can get blurry is which one is which across generic and descriptive or descriptive and suggestive. But that's something fun for my students to have an exam on, not you guys. So we've got um, two slides on the spectrum to kind of help us put them in categories. So we go from least protectable to most protectable. And this is a degree as to which one of these can serve as a source indicating function. So a generic one would be sea salt. Now I just have a picture of Morton. Morton would be protectable, but sea salt is not. Now fish fry by itself, normally wouldn't be protectable, but in that particular case with Zatarans, enough people in the relevant market, actually being New Orleans, uh, it achieved uh, secondary meaning and became registered as a trademark. Now these next two, Jaguar and Citibank, they are suggestive. Jaguar is fast, the Jaguar cars are fast. Citibank is a bank in the city. However, I would argue that Citibank might be descriptive because it's describing a characteristic of it, a bank in the city. You could also argue that Jaguar is suggestive because, I'm sorry, it is arbitrary because it's a use, it's a, a familiar thing in an unfamiliar way, just like an apple for computers or a camel for cigarettes. And if a camel is cool enough to smoke, so am I. Um, and then these last two over here, these are fanciful, Kodak and Exxon, they're made up solely for uh, being used as a trademark. So over here, we've got a couple more um, 
uh, graphics to help us understand. Um, and like a good intellectual property attorney, I did not cite where I got these. I don't even have any idea anymore. So we'll start with the one on the left. These are all gasoline related, so service stations. So a generic term is gasoline. Now descriptive is Travel Center of America. You immediately get an idea of what that is. Um, oh, it's probably a gas station or something close to that. Travel Center all over the country. Now mobile hints at an attribute of the product or service because gasoline helps you be mobile because it powers your car and you can move around. An arbitrary mark is totally not related to the product or the service. 76 presumably refers to when um, the U.S. declared independence in 1776, or when we became a country in 1776, rather. Um, I don't do history so good. But if it was like 89 or 93, that might actually make it descriptive or suggestive because that could be the octane rating. Um, so that's a little different. And then Exxon is a fanciful made up word because it's derived from SO, first the letters SO for standard oil, and then ESSO, which was the predecessor to Exxon. Let me come back over here to this other side. Now, I like this graphic because it's got band aid and thermos, which I do not think actually are generic trademarks, but it talks about, gives us a good. A, a good warning. Trademarks can become genericized if the, um, the 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 trademark or the brand name that you're used to becomes so associated with the product itself, not the actual company or the origin of the product. So, Band Aid has always been at risk for being uh, genericized for band for uh, bandages. Kleenex for tissues, Xerox for copies, Velcro for hook and loop. Um, aspirin is generic. So when you go, you can buy CVS brand aspirin now, but that was actually a trademark owned by the Bayer company. Um, and if this has a registration on it now that we're looking at, that's for the logo. And Thermos, I don't believe Thermos is generic, but it's possible it is. But the logo would still be probably owned by the Thermos company. Um, descriptive marks, I'm not really clear to which extent any of these are actually descriptive, but they make a good point here. Sharp for the sharp picture of a television, British Airways, Airway from from Britain, from Britain, and Best Buy because it's, I guess, good prices. And then we got Jaguar again, Microsoft because it's software and it's micro, Netflix, internet, movie flicks. Then here's our arbitrary trademarks. We've got Apple for computers and not fruit, Dove for soap and not birds, Shell for uh, oil and not shells. And then Kodak, Exxon, and then Polaroid, um, all made up for use as, as trademarks. Um, so earning rights through use in commerce. Um, in order to get a trademark registration at the federal level, you ultimately have to use your trademark in commerce. Now, you don't have to, sorry, you don't have to apply for it by using it in commerce, but at some point you will have to show use in commerce. So um, I always joke about if I sell hot dogs outside of the back of my car and call it Mark's Delicious Meat um, at five o'clock after work, when everybody's going home, to make a little extra cash, people will start as associating my business, Mark's Delicious Meats, with my open trunk outside my office building on Poitras um, and I earn rights in commerce right away. Now, if it's a federal trademark, you'd think interstate commerce, but pretty much anything affects interstate commerce. If I'm selling you hot dogs here, you're not buying hot dogs at Rouse's, and that means you're not getting the Rouse's truck that came off the interstate. So presumably it affects interstate commerce. Um, I have a picture of Lucky Dogs here because it's a hot dog cart. I don't actually have one of me uh, selling hot dogs, not yet. And then uh, they're our client anyway, so they probably don't mind. So trademark rights are earned by actually selling them uh, or selling your product in connection with your brand. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. I don't want to go out there and start selling something because somebody might take my name. I would much rather go file first and then go start selling. You can do that. You can file an application without use. It's called an intent to use. And you say, hey, trademark office, um, 
I want to get an application. Can I have it? And they'll say, yeah, let's take a look. Then just come back later and show me you're using it. It adds a little bit of an extra fee, but it's okay. All right, so trademark registration. If you want to file a federal application with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, these are the applications that really give you the rights. Um, you get uh, rights internationally, uh, or rights nationally, and then you can piggyback on a federal application and file international applications, uh, and you can key yourself into um, international system. Um, you can also do that with patents in a, in a way, but um, we don't have enough time to do that today to talk about either one of those. Um, any pre-existing user that somebody that was using your name prior to you would continue to get would continue to be allowed to operate. Um, but if you file your federal application and beat some, beat everybody else, it's pretty much yours. So let's walk through this. And if you want to file a trademark application anywhere and get strong enforceable rights. Uh, filing at, at the federal level is the way to go. Um, so how's this going to work? You show up with your application, and let's say your application is for the Ella project in conjunction with uh, legal services. So what the trademark office is going to say is, okay, is there any other trademark on the federal register that would be confusingly similar to consumers as to the source or origin of the product or services? So restated in, in English, because I know that's just all legalese. Does any other company have a trademark registered that would make consumers think the two products came from the same company? So example one, Delta Airlines and Delta Faucet. Well, we talked about that. No. McDonald's restaurant and Senior McDonald's burritos? Probably, right? Uh, that seems like something McDonald's would do. And the names are the same, pretty much. Microsoft and Microsoftware Solutions, definitely, right? Those are almost identical. So the trademark office will compare the similarity in the trademarks and the similarity in the goods and the services. So even if a trademark is registered, trademark owner can still be sued for trademark infringement. So um, it's a different thought process. So Javon is asking what fees are associated with trademarks. That's an excellent question. So much like a patent search, you can also do a trademark search um, and that we can do, there's a different set of vendors that will, uh, we can get a search report um, that will help us look out and see if um, any other uh, registration or third party might have um, something that could um, provide uh, a block, but this is always a crystal ball. Um, Th those vendors cost 176 bucks to get a report. We usually charge a couple hours of attorney time. So that can run like 500 to 700 bucks or so, sometimes a little bit more. Um, that's just if you go in our office. Um, you can also go on USPTO.gov and search trademarks. Um, so if you, you know exactly what you're going to look for um, and go type it in, you can, you can usually get an exact hit. Um, they've got their own little search uh, engine online. Um, we don't do that in our office. We, we might do a spot check in our office. Like if I knew I was applying for the Yellow Project, I'd type in the Yellow Project and see what happens. Um, but we like the to use the vendors because they can do um, phonetic searches where they get letters that sound like it and combinations of letters that sound like it and cast a wider net. Um, and, it, and it's very effective. But um, that's an optional thing. But I like the crystal ball because you can kind of see what's coming and see if anybody else has rights that might get mad at you. Um, a trademark application, if an attorney handles it, would probably be somewhere between 250 and 400 bucks, depending on what you're doing. Um, and then the filing fee uh, for the government is $250 per class. So the uh, trademark office or the international trademark system rather, buckets different goods and services in what's called international classes. So if you were gonna make pharmaceuticals and then uh, tennis shoes, and then alcoholic spirits. Those would all be in different classes, which are like different buckets, because um, they're not all the same. If they were all related, like you were making pens, pencils, and office supplies, those would all be in one bucket. So the filing fee is per class. That would be 250 bucks per class. So if you were kind of operating in the same zone, 250 bucks. If you had um, things that were a little bit different, 
um, uh, be multiples of that. And then also sometimes the online sales or the retail services are different than, or, almost, or are going to be different than the goods themselves. So online or physical retail sa sales of water bottles would be different than the water bottles themselves. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, and then if you get a rejection or something, um, there can be fees associated with um, going back and forth. Um, and then just with patents and trademark, uh, every so often, if you have a federal one, you'll have to pay some maintenance fees to keep them alive. Um, the government always needs money. Um, so don't, don't, don't forget them when you're writing your checks. All right. These are some of the factors that the, or these are all the factors really that the, the patent office might look at um, when they're thinking about confusion between two marks. But the two, the two most important are number one, number two. The similarity of the marks, including appearance, sound, connotation, and commercial impression, and the sim similarity in nature of the covered goods and services. Um, sometimes you can kind of go through the rest of these if you really need to, uh, if you're getting a lot of static, um, but those are the main ones. All right, before we go into trademark infringement, I'm gonna show you what a trademark application looks like. So this is a draft application I've gotten to the end. Can you trademark your artist name? Um, you can, um, you don't necessarily, don't always need to. Um, sometimes Gene likes to chip in with uh, thoughts on that. So I'll definitely let him um, pop in if he'd like. Um, but you can absolutely, so you can absolutely trademark um, any kind of a pseudonym or a band name or anything. That's definitely trademark material. Well, let me jump in on that, Mark, because I think it's an interesting question. And I certainly mm -hmm. don't have a legal opinion, but I do always have this question of what, when people want to do that is what the ultimate goal is. Um, and I always look at it is that that makes sense once the artist has already achieved a level of success that someone showing up in a different town and saying, I'm performing as, you know, the great uh, Blandino makes sense. Um, otherwise, it never really seemed to make a lot of sense to me. You know, basically, you've got your name. Um, that's going to be associated with your performance. Um, if you have a name that is unique enough, no one's really going to make a huge deal about it until you hit the level that it would actually make sense. And that really is, I think, a relic of like 1960s, because they used to do that in the 1960s. You would have barnstorming tours where they would be like, now featuring the Big Bopper. Well, it wasn't the Big Bopper. It was somebody else who was looking that way. Um, but I wonder these days, Mark, if you see really any utility in it, even though it's possible, what the real benefit would there be? Um, yeah, the other thing too is, um, you can always do it later if it starts becoming a problem, you don't, exactly. you don't really lose the rights. Um, you know, getting to the trademark office first can be helpful. Um, so if you think there's going to be another band somewhere else or, and you're concerned somebody else is going to use your name. Um, the other thing too is, uh, having a trademark uh, registration can be helpful for social media takedowns. Um, so if there was for some reason a copycat account or, um, somebody was using your account or another account or another name that you wanted to go after them, that can be helpful. But, uh, for the most part, um, you know, unless you think that somebody is going to be, or unless, yeah, unless you're, you've exceeded some level of fame, as Jim is mentioning, um, it may not be that high up on the priority list. Um, but, and also, it's not that expensive, but, you know, artists and musicians, you know, as you're trying to accumulate um, funds, it, it sometimes makes more sense not to be paying legal fees. So it's just kind of a something to consider for the budget. Um, those are the kinds of things that come to my mind right away. Nice. Mm -hmm. Let's go into the application. Okay. Um, so this is an application for... The Ella project that I have um, made, it is not real. Um, so this is what it looks like. I'm just going to quickly scroll. So it's not very long. Um, so this is what a filing receipt. Uh, you're, you're welcome, Tracy. That's more. For, Gene is really the one that we're thinking there. Um, so um, 
The form does not look like this. The form is about eight different pages or so on the website. Um, it's it's doable to use. Um, like most things, I, I would recommend getting a lawyer. You can figure it out and go through it and that's fine. Um, it can also be a little finicky because if you do it wrong at the beginning, it can be hard to go back and fix. Um, and then, uh, especially with soup, they have a super long wait time right now. A couple of years ago, there was a huge influx of international applications. So the wait time is almost nine months. Um, so when you're filing, when you're filling out your application, you put, uh, what do you want the trademark ad to be? And you just say the yellow project, and then you put your address and then you got to say what you're doing. Um, you can't lock up a word. You can't lock up a phrase. You have to have it in connection with a particular good or service. So what business are you in? You got to, you got to tailor that. Um, so here, what does the Ella project do? Well, they do legal services. They do intellectual property consultancy services for nonprofit organizations. Um, pro bono legal services for artists, musicians, entertainers, and inventors. Providing legal services to artists, musicians, entertainers, and inventors through public advocacy programs. The reasons, I, the reason I briefly paused there before I kept reading is because I should have finished my thought. But the red language is customizable. There are some rooms that you can customize, but you can actually pick these from a list. So this was already there. So intellectual property consultancy services for nonprofit organizations. Um, that's pretty much what they're doing. Pro bono legal services, yeah. And then I added who it was for. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of preset, thousands, thousands of presets, um, whether it's golf services, hats, bandanas, you name it. Um, and you can tailor it. You can also pay a hundred bucks more and do a completely customizable one. You put your first use date. Um, when did you start using it? You have a specimen and I have a preview of the Ella Projects website. Um, so you can see co-founder Ashley there. He is. Um, and then um, there's Ashley Jean and Chief Howard. Then there's little Louisiana and Vince. And this shows the services being used with the mark. You have to show evidence of use in commerce. So here is the Ella Projects logo. Here's legal services for a pro bono. Uh, this, now that I look at it, this specimen is actually not sufficient because it did not catch the URL, the date, um, and has to have those, but otherwise it would have been just fine. Now I do have that URL and date in the application, so it would be okay, but um, without that, it wouldn't work. And then I just have my name in here. We probably wouldn't be able to use projects, so you can make a disclaimer. So if I was selling salt, I would say no exclusive right to, make, to sell salt. Um, my address, you sign it, and it's done. Pretty simple process um, once you get to the point of where you know what to put in there. Selecting your goods and services is usually the hard part. Um, so infringement, two companies are allegedly using the same or the similar trademark in commerce. One company sues the other company for trademark infringement with the goal of stopping the other company's use of the trademark. There has to be consumer confusion, otherwise both companies continue to operate. So this means that we assume because of the coexistence of these two companies in the marketplace, people are confused about them. And I'm looking at the time, I've only got about two slides left, so we're almost done. Um, so I say has to be. Now, if, there's a if one of the marks is famous, I'm talking Disney, Coca-Cola, Nike, that kind of thing. Um, you don't have to say that there's consumer confusion. That dilution is what that's called. And you say, oh, they're gonna, they're gonna weaken my fame through diluting it. Um, so if I wanted to just call myself Disney's hot dogs, I would be in trouble quick. So uh, one of the questions is who was first? Um, so if a, a junior user sues a senior user, meaning who is coming second, uh, the senior user may get geographically locked in if the junior user has a federal trademark. There's actually a mom and pop Burger King up in Illinois that the home of the Whopper can't go near, but the, the mom and pop can't expand. And if there is no federal trademark, uh, whoever was the first user in commerce probably wins. Um, if the senior user sues a junior user, the junior user may have to stop using the trademark. Um, so how do you analyze trademark infringement? You've got um, some factors. So 
I'm using the one that's out of New York because I like the way they read a little bit better, but we have some that are very close to this. Um, so you have the strength of the mark. So how strong is it on that spectrum from generic all the way to fanciful? How close are the two marks? So the degree of similarity. I'm, I've got another slide on these two, the marketplace proximity and the likelihood that the senior user will, of the mark will bridge the gap. I'll come back to those. And then we talk about likelihood of confusion. Well, let's just actual confusion. Why don't we have to speculate? If people are actually confused, that should just take us over the edge. That's the strongest element, even though it's number five. Um, the junior years is bad faith. So are they clearly copying them to try to, try to uh, knock off? And then the quality of the junior user goods, are they cheap knockoff? And then the sophistication of the consumer group. So we're not trying to be offensive here. It's just, are you rolling into a gas station, grabbing some stuff off the shelf, or are you some sort of a high level professional that's going to take their time and differentiate and pay a lot of money for something? Um, Cause if you're more of a sloppy purchase, you're more likely to be confused. So if you apply these factors to decide a case um, and you ultimately determine that consumers would be confused, um, the, one of the outcomes would occur and somebody might need to change their, uh, change their trademark. Uh, and you might have to pay some money. If not, everybody might just get to keep operating. Um, so, sorry, Linnell, I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, so trademark infringement here. So those last two factors, the marketplace proximity of the two marks, um, how close are the two companies geographically and how close are the two product lines? And then the likelihood that the senior user of the mark will bridge the gap. Um, that is, what are the chances that the company that used the mark first is likely to extend in the junior user's geographic area or product line? And that's, now it's your turn. Questions, comments, concerns? Do you have regrets about being here? Uh, I think, is that Linnell? Yes. I had the question about, do you help caterers? Um, she may be thinking more on the lines of like the secretary of state, just kind of registering her name. Um, I'm I'm not sure. Just wanted to kind of clarify that. Yes, all that. I'm not sure. sure. So I mean, Mark obviously will work with anybody for Ella Project. Um, for this program, unlike for patent, um, we do focus more on the arts and culture sphere. Um, and while we love caterers, it's not really within our mission. Oh, and thanks for the compliment there from iPhone mm -hmm. to everyone. <laughs> Appreciate it. And then here's our contact info. So if anyone would like it, I'm uh, absolutely happy to um, um, to chat. I know Gene's always uh, open for business. Very grateful to be here today. Um, thank for. Will uh, you share this presentation or? Sure. Okay. Yeah, and then. Um, I think we have uh, just a brief disclaimer that this doesn't constitute legal advice for informational purposes only. <laughs> so uh, yes. if you have specific questions about anything that you'd like to do or want to follow up, uh, definitely let us know. But this is mostly for um, uh, for uh, just kind of a general idea. And, and thank you guys all in the chat. Appreciate y'all. They love you, Mark. Mark. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Um, Margaret, anything else you think we could add that would be helpful considering um, the uh, the general um, attendance we usually have in the questions at these events? Yeah, I think you pretty much covered um, covered everything. I would like to ask Linnell to, to come on. Maybe she could explain it, uh, explain what she's trying to say. Because I'm, I'm getting a little confused. Miss Price? She may have dropped off. I'm not sure. Okay. She may be a little shy. Um, but yeah, you. I think you covered everything. Um, very informative. Uh, a lot of information. Uh, definitely thank you guys for last minute um, agreeing to participate. And yeah, it, it was great. I thank you so much. My pleasure. Yes. Um, oh, thanks, Linda. Appreciate it. <laughs> awesome. Well, looking forward to assisting you guys any way we can moving forward. So keep us on uh, keep us on the Rolodex. Yes, we'll definitely keep you um, in mind for future uh, events and and. 
definitely want to partner with you guys. Look awesome. forward to it, Margaret. Thanks again, and thanks for everyone for joining us today. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day. It's a beautiful day outside. Okay, thanks. one more time. Are there any other questions? Going once, going <laughs> twice. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today, especially our guest speakers for their awesome presentation. Uh, within five to 10 business days, this session will be available on the Office of Economic Development YouTube channel, uh, along with previously recorded sessions. Our next session is Thursday, February the 22nd. And our guest speakers are representatives from the Louisiana Secretary of State. Remember to check your emails for reminders. I hope you will join us again. It was lovely having you guys. Again, my name is Margaret McGee. Don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. I'm always here uh, to assist you. Have a great day. You too, Margaret. Thanks again. Okay.